Hi guys, welcome to this video. I'll be going over the first paper of um, OCR Physics A, which is the modelling physics. And um, because this is a really, really long paper, I've decided to do two videos. Um, and in this particular one, I will be going through section uh, one, which is the multiple choice questions. And it contains uh, 15 questions. So let's get started with the first one. So in the first question, it says that a student has constructed the table below of the possible scalar and vector quantities. Um, which row is correct? Okay, so for acceleration, well, it is not a scalar quantity, it is a vector quantity. So that's out. Displacement is also a vector quantity. Frequency, yes, it is a scalar quantity. However, wavelength is a scalar quantity too. So that's out. So D is the answer. For question number two. It says the diameter of the wire is measured in five different places along its length, and we need to work out the absolute uncertainty in the diameter. So the way you work it out is simply you take the range and divide it by two. So that will be 1.92 minus 1.86 over two. So the answer will be 0 0.03, and B is the correct option. For question number three, we are given that a student has plotted a velocity against time graph and um, which of the following pair of quantities can be determined from the gradient of the graph and the area under the graph. So we know that um, the acceleration is the gradient, okay, that's the change in velocity over change in time and the area under the graph is the displacement. So A is the answer um, for question number three. For question number four, we are given that the diagram below shows the directions and the magnitudes of the three forces acting on an object at a specific time as it moves through water. And the weight of the object is 1.2 newtons, up thrust is 0 0.8, and the drag is 0 0.6. Which statement is correct about this object at the specific time? So, um, A, it has reached its terminal velocity. Well, terminal velocity is reached when the forces are balanced. And in this case, the forces are not balanced as the resistive forces altogether add up to 1.4 newtons and the downward force of weight is 1.2 newtons so A is incorrect. It is accelerating. Um, no, it will not be accelerating. In fact, it will be C, deceleration, because as it's going down, it is slowing down and that's because the resistive forces are greater than the uh, forward forces, okay, the downward force. So C is the answer. Now, for question number five, we've been given an object below, which is in, uh, in equilibrium. A force not shown on the diagram also acts on the object at point P. Which of the following shows the correct direction and the magnitude of the force acting at point P? So we can see that the 10 newtons of force over here is balanced by this downward force of 10 newtons. Hence, I'm going to go for B as my option, which will clearly balance out the force of 5.6 newtons acting at 30 degrees and so 5.6 will be acting opposite in the opposite direction so that'll be my uh, answer. Now for question number six we have been given a particle x which is uh, of mass m collides with a stationary particle y of mass 4m. Immediately after the collision particle x is moving at a, cons uh, well, at a velocity of v1 at an angle of 60 degrees to its original direction and particle y is moving with velocity v2 at 90 degrees to the velocity of particle x. So we've been given before the collision and after the collision situation. What is the ratio of v1 over v2? So for this we have to use the conservation of momentum in two directions. And to understand this I think I'm going to first of all resolve the momentum in the uh, horizontal and the vertical directions. Okay, so for particle x, I'm just going to draw it out separately over here. So it's going to be, that is the v1, and this is 60 degrees. So this is going to be for particle x, m v1 cos of 60, and the upward will be m1, sorry, m v1 sine of 60. Similarly for particle y, so this is for x, and for particle y, this angle right here is 30, as this is 90. Okay, so to the horizontal, V1, sorry, V2, 
right here, 30 degrees, and therefore that will be 4mv2 cos of 60, followed by a downward, vertically downward momentum of 4mv2 sine of 60. Sorry, sine of 30, my bad. So cos of 30, apologies. Right, anyway, so from here now, we um, all we have to look at is initially the momentum along the horizontal plane is um, could be given by the total momentum of x and y. However, we don't know the velocity with which x is moving. So we can't quite write down the momentum um, along the horizontal plane, right? Because it would introduce a another unknown. So instead, we do know that momentum before the collision along the y-plane, okay, is zero. So therefore, momentum afterwards along the y-plane will also be zero, which means that m1, uh, mv1 sine of 60 minus, let's say, 4mv2 sine of 30 will be equal to zero. So now from here, if you just study up this equation, I'm going to divide everything by m to cancel this out, and v1 sine of 60 equals, I'm also going to add the second term to the right hand side, 4 v2 sine of 30, dividing both the sides by um, simply v2, okay, so v1 over v2, I'm also going to divide both the sides by sine 60, so 4 sine 30 over sine of 60 will end up giving me my answer, okay, and that turns out to be 2.3, so a is the correct option. Okay, let's move on to the next question, number seven. So in question number seven, we are given a metal block of mass M is heated by an electric heater. The graph of temperature theta against time T for this block is given below. The power of the heater is P, the gradient is G. What is the correct expression for the specific heat capacity? Okay, so we need to <coughs> relate the equation energy equals mc theta, or change in temperature, so I can just use delta theta, okay, um, and relate this to power and the gradient of this graph. So in order to introduce power, I need to divide both the sides by t, okay, so as to basically get e over t as power, p, okay, mc, and I know that this bit right here is the gradient, which is represented by g, okay, so quite simply, c is going to be equal to p over m times by g, okay, and so for that reason, d is the correct option here. Right, let's move on to now question number eight. So it says that which statements below are implied by the assumption of kinetic theory model of gases? A, well, number one, a gas is mostly empty space. Yes, that's right. Number two, gas particles spend more time between the collisions than time during the collisions. Yes, that's also true. And there are always forces between the gas particles? No, there are negligible forces in the gas particles, between the gas particles. So A is our safe answer here. Okay, so for question number nine, we are given that a container has one mole uh, of gas and um, at 100 kilopascals of temp uh, pressure. The root mean square speed of the gas particles is 500 meters per second and the mass is also given of the each of uh, each gas particle okay and we need to figure out the volume of the container so given that the particles or are all spread out in the container the volume held by the particles altogether will be equal to the volume of the container so we've been given an equation which will be helpful in this particular case which is p v equals a third of n m c squared like so. And um, just bear in mind that n is the number of all the particles, okay, and one mole of um, anything contains the Avogadro's constant. So v is equal to a third of um, n m c squared over p, okay, and that's going to be number of particles therefore in one mole, as I said, Avogadro's constant is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 times by the mass, which is 4.7, times 10 to the minus 26, times by the speed squared, okay? Just be careful over here, that is 500 squared and not just 500, okay? So that is divided by three times 
uh, pressure, which is 100,000. So that ends up giving me um, an answer of C, okay, 2.4 times 10 to the minus 2. Okie doke. So for question number 10, it says that a mass is attached to the bottom end of a spring, which is attached at the top end, which is fixed at the top end, sorry. The mass is displaced vertically and then released, okay? And the mass oscillates with simple harmonic motion, which Rho correctly describes the energy of this spring mass system when the mass is at its lowest point. Okay, so if you were to just picture this, that you have a mass um, spring system, and let's just say it was like right at the bottom, at its lowest point, okay, um, and then um, what would be the energy uh, energy stores at that point? Well, it will definitely have maximum elastic potential energy because it's stretched to its maximum. It will have minimum gravitational potential energy because it is at the least height from the ground, and it will have zero kinetic energy, okay, because it is not moving. So B will be my answer here. Right. Now, for question number 11, we are given a bunch of quantities and they're asking which pair of quantities do not have the same units or equivalent units. So acceleration and gravitational field strength, they do, they both have the same uh, units as either newtons per kilogram or meters per second squared. Angular frequency and angular velocity, they also have the same units okay, or per second. Um, gravitational potential and kinetic energy, well, they don't. Okay, because gravitational potential is potential rather than energy, and therefore it's not in joules or not equivalent to joules. Okay, so C is the answer here. Okay, so let's move on to question number 12 now. So in this diagram, we are given three energy levels X, Y, and Z of an electron with a, within a gas atom. Which transition is correct when the electron absorbs a photon with the shortest wavelength? Okay. So when it absorbs, it will jump up, okay? So it will be a transition from either Z to an X or um, Y to an X, etc. okay? Now, it, we need to realize that when we are given shortest energy, uh, sorry, shortest wavelength, we know that energy of a photon is HC over lambda, which means that for the shortest wavelength, the energy is greatest, okay? Energy is the largest, okay? so. For that largest energy transition, the answer will be A, because the gap between Z and X is the highest, okay? So that's going to be the answer. Right, so for question number 13 now, we are given that a light from a hydrogen source is incident normally at the diffraction grating, and we are given that the first order maximum of the H alpha spectral line of wavelength 486 nanometers is observed at an angle of 30 degrees. Light from a distant, uh, distant receding star okay, is observed using the same diffraction grating and it is normally incident as before. The speed of the star is 0 0.6, sorry, 0 0.16 c, where c is the speed of light in a vacuum. What is the observed angle of the first order maximum of this H alpha spectral line coming from the star, this receding star? Okay, so there are two um, concepts over here playing uh, up. One is the diffraction grating equation, um, and the other one is Doppler effect. Okay, so um, first things first, in order to work out the angle, we need the main equation, which relates the angle and the wavelength, okay, as d sine theta equals n lambda, where n is the number of orders, which is one. And so essentially, in, gen in, in this particular case, we can say that um, d sine theta is just equal to lambda. Now, secondly, with respect to the change in speed, we need to get the change in wavelength because um, it's a receding star, it's moving away from you, and so we need to get that change in wavelength which is given to us by this equation here. Okay, change in wavelength over wavelength, the original wavelength, equaling v over c, uh, where v is the speed of the uh, star in this case. Okay, so I can easily work out delta lambda change in wavelength first as 0 0.16 c over c times by the wavelength, okay, which is 4 point, um, sorry, 486 nanometers, okay, and I'm going to just spare 
us from writing down each and every uh, little detail, all the numbers, but if you put in the lambda into here um, as 486 nanometers and of course convert it into meters, you will end up getting 7.776 times 10 to the minus 8 meters. Okay, so this is the change in wavelength. Okay, we'll hold on to that, come back to it in a second. Secondly, we need to work out the value of D because the diffraction grating used for the star is the same as before. Okay, so D is simply written as lambda, which is 486 times 10 to the minus 9 over sine of 30. Okay, and that would give me a value of 9.72 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Now, combining these two to figure out the value of theta requires us to know what that wavelength actually is. This, bear in mind, is the change in wavelength, okay? So change in wavelength is lambda 2 minus lambda 1, where lambda 1 is the original, okay, 486 nanometers. So the new wavelength, okay, which is received from this receding star is going to be 7.776 times 10 to the minus 8 plus 486 nanometers, okay? So that is going to give us 5.6376 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, okay? So I'm just going to put that down as this is my lambda 1 for reference, okay? And now we have everything to work out the value of theta, okay? So theta is simply equal to sine inverse of lambda over d, okay, and we have lambda, which is lambda 2, okay, over d, which is 9.72 times 10 to the minus 7. And when I put in all the numbers, I end up getting d as my answer, okay, 35.5 degrees. So this one was quite a mean question to be put for one mark, but it is what it is. Let's move on to the next question now. Okay, so for question number 14, um, a galaxy uh, 1.0, or rather just 10 to the 9 light years away from Earth has a recession speed of 23,000 kilometers per second. Which expression based on information above is correct for the age of the universe in seconds? Okay, so age of the universe is actually given to us by the Hubble equation constant, um, sorry, Hubble constant, okay, which is V equals H naught D, okay, and where essentially H naught t is equal to 1 over h0. Okay, however, we're not really concerned with Hubble constant right here. Um, um, you know, Hubble constant is just 1 over t. Okay. Um, now, we are working out the age of the universe using the distance and the speed. Okay, so to be honest, we can quite simply use t is equal to d divided by the speed okay, of, so distance in meters okay, and speed in meters per second. Okay, so from the data booklet, we know that one light year is equal to 9.5 times 10 to the 15 meters, okay, in length. So therefore, and, and also with respect to the speed, it has to be in meters per second, okay? So you have to times the bottom number by a thousand and the top number by, you know, this light, light year conversion, okay? so. C will be the correct option here, as you would observe. Right, for our last question, here we are given that astronomers observe approximately the same number of distant galaxies per unit volume of space in all directions. Which idea does this observation support? And the correct answer is B, okay, cosmological principle. And you would probably agree if I, I don't wanna go over the definitions of each one of them, but cosmological principle suggests exactly this statement right here. Okay, so it's really straightforward. So this is the end of this particular video. I will be doing another one next week for the rest of the paper, section B. Um, so stay tuned for that. And thanks ever so much for listening.